annual media and telecom symposium. Rainbow Push has been on the forefront of fighting for fairness and equity in Congress, the FCC, and in companies, uh, whether traditional or non-traditional in media ownership, whether it be television, radio, newspapers, media images, broadband access and opportunities, as well as um, we've had a bit of a specialty niche in the cr criminal justice reform, fighting for fairness and equity uh, in affordable telephone rates, in prisons, and et cetera. Today, we are uh, beginning our session and the, the session is entitled Putting Fairness in Technologies, Tackling Criminal Justice in Inequalities. Our moderator today is Adone Washington. She is the Digital Justice Associate Counsel of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. I'm going to turn it over to her and she can introduce our panelists today and go into our discussion. Thank you, Adone. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you for having me. Um, I am happy to be here and honored to be the moderator uh, in this discussion with Dr. Rishon Ray, who is the senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, as well as the professor of sociology and executive, executive director of the Lab for Applied Social Science and Research at the University of Maryland College Park. Welcome. Thank so, you so much for having me. I look forward to this uh to this important conversation yes um so let's you know get right into it um almost two years from the murder of george floyd uh and cell phone footage had a lot to do um with convicting derek chauvin in that case uh what is your take on civilian use of technology when it comes to exposing police brutality um and we can take that more into a recent context with the um the case for Ahmaud Arbery um, and how that case turned out, and you know how how can we apply the use of the service, um, excuse me, of cell phone footage and the like for these cases? Well, look, I, I think that uh, recordings and video evidence of these type of incidents are essential. They are essential, and I'll kind of walk people through uh, the, the the typical process that you know all too well that happens in criminal proceedings that people oftentimes don't see. And of course, one of the recent things that people saw was Reverend Jackson, uh, Reverend Sharpton and others literally being heckled in a court of law where the defense attorneys for the I mean, Michaels and Bryant who murdered Ahmaud Arbery were not just sending uh, dog whistles at the jury, and other people in that town, they were sending loud bullhorns about what it means to engage in respectability politics, what it means to try to suppress um, Black people's voices. And so, of course, that's the tip of the iceberg. And, and we can even just use that as an example, because without that video evidence, without videos being allowed in a court of law, people wouldn't see that. But you know, like I know, those sort of comments are unfortunately made on a regular basis when there are cases that are high profile, um, even oftentimes low profile cases that are laced uh, with race. So when it comes to thinking about these cases, I think it's important to, to note, when we look at what happened with Derek Chauvin, when we look at what happened in the murder convictions of three people who killed Ahmaud Arbery, imagine if we did not have that video evidence. It'll probably be similar to, uh, to what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, even though the people that he killed and harmed were white, they were there in many regards, at least what the protest was there for, was to aim to move us toward a more uh, racially just and equitable society. So the ideology of racial equity is what was being pursued, regardless of who the person was. So the video evidence is essential in how these sort of things play out. And importantly, in both um, incidents, when we think about the murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, it was individuals using their own cell phone technology in one case one of the actual murderers and in the other cases with with george floyd a bystander um a young person who had the wherewithal to record this video evidence now of course there were also street views that played a role and one of the people testified who was working for the city said that 
uh, Derek Chauvin was on George Floyd's neck for so long that she thought that the video has stopped, that it had paused because he did not move. So that video evidence was essential. And part of the reason why it's essential is because oftentimes what defense attorneys do, and the prosecution does it on the other end, depending on uh, the, the way that these racialized cases play out, but they oftentimes construct the narrative of black criminality. They construct the narrative where blackness becomes weaponized, where even if a black person doesn't have a weapon, like with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, they weaponize our physical bodies and put in the minds of jurors that a black person's body can cause enough, enough harm. Let's think about, let's go back to one of the one of the catalysts for the Black Lives Matter movement, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Now, of course, they didn't start the Black Lives Matter movement. That was Trayvon Martin. But we can think about what happened with Mike Brown and what happened with Ahmaud Arbery and juxtapose them with what happened to George Floyd. And I mean, sorry, we can juxtapose Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin to what happened with uh, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And in those two incidents with Brown, and Martin, we did not have video evidence. When, whereas with Arbery and uh, George Floyd, we did. One thing we know with Michael Brown, when the officer who killed him got on the stand for the grand jury testimony where he was not indicted, when Darren Wilson was not indic indicted, he said that Michael Brown looked like a demon. He said that I felt like a five-year-old and he looked like Hulk Hogan. When we think about those superlatives, those adjectives that are used to describe Michael Brown, he sounds like a monster. What are you going to do to quill that? Well, of course, you have to shoot it. And of course, you have to shoot it multiple times. And I'm saying it because that is the way he was describing a human being, as if Michael Brown was not a person when both of them were large men. Both of them were 6'4". So, so part of thinking about that we oftentimes only have one part of the story and the story oftentimes go to the goes to the hunter and not the hunted and we know that there is a key statistic that we're talking about here and that's the fact well actually two now when we talk about vigilante justice but first black people are 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when they're not attacking or when they have a weapon that is the story of george floyd but then we also know when it comes to vigilante justice that when a white person kills a black person, compared to just when, when one person kills another person and claims self-defense, when a white person kills a black person and claims self-defense, they are eight times, eight times more likely to be found not guilty. And these are the two statistics that video evidence can disrupt. The second main point here is in addition to the video evidence, what it oftentimes leads to is a local jurisdiction calling in people at the state level. That's what happened with the Ahmaud Arbery case, they called in uh, the they called in the people at the state level. That also happened with George Floyd. That did not happen in those other cases. So part of what happens is video evidence can spur not only people paying attention. Unfortunately, we might not even know about what happened to Ahmaud Arbery because we know there was conspiracy and corruption that was happening down there in New Brunswick, Georgia. But then it also leads to additional oversight and accountability by bringing in people at another level who can provide more obje more objectivity and transparency in the process. Thank you. You point out a, a few things um, aside from the eight times more likely, uh, which is kind of not kind of is incredibly concerning. Um, and, and so we know that you've researched and written um, a lot about mechanisms that manufacture and maintain racial and social inequality, um, with a particular focus on the surveillance technologies um, that law enforcement use. So we'll come back to a few other ones. But if you could share um, what is being deployed and why we should be worried about their use or why the general public should be concerned about their use and then why those in marginalized communities should be very concerned about those their use. Yeah, well, one thing that I'll say now, and I know we'll talk about it later, but um, the legalities of the technology is what's concerning. And to go ahead and 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 throw out one of the one of my main theses here is that the privatization of the technologies is part of the problem. Legislation can't keep up with it, but we'll, we'll come back to that. When it comes to the specific technologies that law enforcement are deploying, of course, body-worn cameras. People have gotten quite familiar with those. Uh, one of the reasons why they matter, we conducted a, a study that we published in a sociology journal several years ago where we were evaluating 
um, the way that that civilians and police officers think about body worn cameras in Prince George's County. Now, still, still now, Prince George's County has not done a good job of rolling this technology out, which is unfortunate. And it gets to a point where you start to see various barriers put up. But I will say that when it comes to certain technologies, they can be costly in ways that people don't necessarily see. Body worn cameras, the equipment is, is fairly inexpensive. You get it, you put a camera, you put it on their chest. What is, is it, what is expensive is the data, the data storage, the video and the audio, where is it gonna be housed? Um, I tend to think that large platforms like say Amazon Web Service, of course, there are other companies, Google and the like, that can have the capacity to house all these data. But that is essentially where we're going. The problem is in housing the data. The other problem with body-worn cameras is in who can access it and when. Those are the key questions, of course, that you know as a lawyer, all the work that you all do, that you all are focusing on around that transparency. But body-worn cameras overall, what we found in that study, and we interviewed hundreds of police officers and civilians. Overwhelmingly, people supported it on both sides. They supported it for slightly different reasons, but it became a, a perfect panacea for policymakers where you have people that we call uh, citizen supporters who would say, look, police officers treat people uh, badly every single day. These body worn cameras are going to show it. And then we have people that we call police supporters. These were people who were like, look, Civilians treat police officers badly every single day. The body worn cameras are going to show it. On the other hand, you had skeptics, but it was no one who really opposed. The skeptics were people who were like, look, body worn cameras are, aren't going to show everything for the police. Um, they, they could get hit from behind and then the camera turns on. And then there were structural skeptics. These are what a lot of people have become over the past year or two, where people are saying, look, we have all these advances in technology. In the 1990s, after Rodney King got beat in LA, we had dash cams. That, those sort of things only changed so much. Accordingly, when it comes to body-worn cameras, again, the key issue is not only storage, but how quickly people can access it. One of the big things as well is when they turn on. I think that the best ways to do the technology is when they come on, when officers uh, get a call or when they are going out onto a call, when their lights come on. In a lot of vehicles, when the lights come on, their body-worn cameras come on. Now, there are others who say we should just leave it on 24 seven. I think that's fine as well. The key issue though, you run into, and you know this, that if you're going into a person's home, you're going into a hospital, you're going into a church, police officers do those things regularly. Now you have a series of concerns there, a series of privacy concerns that have to be worked out and they still haven't been worked out well. I'll mention two more and then I know we'll, we'll keep having this conversation. I think the, the other two that are that are quite problematic or, or um, are concerning, one is dealing with hot spot policing. What hot spot policing does is it takes a, essentially it's a heat map of an area say Washington DC or you know Detroit Michigan or these other cities and what they say is is where are the areas where we're mo most likely to have crime okay based on that we are going to flood our resources to those particular areas well unfortunately we know oftentimes these are lower income neighborhoods and they tend to be predominantly black and latino now for some people they say well that's what happens when crime is high in those neighborhoods we'll see here goes the problem um, and studies from New York to DC and elsewhere have continued to show this. That, okay, on one hand, we think places that have more crime are gonna experience a higher, higher level of policing to reduce that crime. The problem is that rarely is the crime decreased by that presence. Instead, what does happen is what we call the illness spillovers of police violence, where not only are people more likely to be profiled and stopped, overwhelmingly people who are not committing a crime, just to be specific about it, a recent study in Washington, D.C. looked at who is stopped and frisk. Yes, that policy is still in effect, even though in a lot of cities it's been ruled as unconstitutional, it is still an everyday practice in law enforcement. And so the assumption is that police officers are stopping people who are committing a crime, have committed a crime, or have some type of contraband or a criminal record. Over 90% of the people who were stopped who had force used upon them were black, and over 90% of those, of those people did not commit a crime. That is the key problem with hot spot policing. It would be different if they were actually focusing on that. And this is important because nationally, about 40% of homicides go unsolved, about nearly 70% of robberies. So part of what that means is the key crimes that no one wants to see in their communities aren't actually being solved. And instead, there are these illness spillovers where the research we've conducted shows that people who live in over-policed neighborhoods controlling for everything under the sun, 
are more likely to experience mental and physical health problems. Uh, in men, they're more likely to be depressed and experience anxiety. For women, they are more likely to experience hypertension and diabetes. And I think these are some of the problems. The final one that I'll mention is geofencing. Geofencing is, is a, a technique that's used by law enforcement to take people's mobile phones and track them and essentially say that they're in a particular area engaging in a particular behavior. Now, some people might say, well, that makes sense. You can really say where people are. Yeah, this is the problem. Rarely is it done with, the, with, with a direct court order. Instead, it's oftentimes done in conjunction with protest or with some sort of event that people know is going on. And that oftentimes exposes people to risk in, in a very sort of different way. The final one that's being used a lot now as well is license plate readers. Um, of course, if you live in a major city, you're, you're pretty accustomed to this. I mean, police officers aren't giving a lot of tickets anymore. It's a camera catching you going 46 and a 35. And uh, you're like, doggone it, the, the speed limit was just 45. Now it's 35 and now you, now you just got a ticket. But then you also have license plate readers that are tracking people. In theory, this technology makes sense. The problem though, is that where they place the license plate readers, research documents are more likely to be in neighborhoods um that are predominantly black and the problem is that these license plate readers should be dispersed equally throughout um, a particular area you thank you you pointed out a few um a few things just with the privacy concerns that come up with um not only body cameras but with all of these technologies so um whether it's the the license plate or um the geo location mapping um, and use of even cell phone data and records to kind of pinpoint where individuals are. And we saw a lot of those um, same issues. And I think you mentioned for activists oftentimes see that as a major concern um, because they are being targeted by their location during these uh, protests, be it peaceful um, or, or otherwise. Um, and oftentimes uh, law enforcement relies upon both dr drone surveillance as well um, and now social media surveillance to to find criminals um, such as in the january 6th insurrection we saw um, a, a flood of, of videos of photographs of um, conversations via different apps that occurred um, and all of this kind of became public just by way of social media um, and so what is your take on the appropriate balance between the use of technologies um, for criminal discovery and how admissible should these surveillance results be in court of law um, the admissibility question is is slightly difficult um, because it's it deals with privacy and actually getting access to um, some of these uh, different kinds of technologies but i'll let you take it yeah no i mean you're exactly right i'm i'm unsure if we know yet um to be honest with you and i think that is the the key problem part of what happens with this technology i mean you mentioned drones i mean look i mean we could talk about a series of other things technologies that police are using i didn't even start talking about the robotic dogs um that are starting to be deployed and and i say this to say that this is where we're going. Um, for, for some of us, we remember a movie, I believe it was the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, called Minority Report. I love that movie, it starred Tom, starred Tom Cruise. The point of this movie was that there was, there was, there was, there was this predictive algorithm in these, in these characters that could predict uh, future crime. And part of what's going on is that there are a lot of people who are aiming to use technologies to do just that. I mean, one mm -hmm. of the things that we're really not even getting into today is, as you know, is the way that technologies are used in a court of law about who should get bail, how much bail they should receive, whether or not they should be able to get out after serving time to get out on parole. I mean, technologies are being used in this way. The key problem with all these technologies is, is this. They go in as if they're race blind when they're mm -hmm. highly racialized. So in turn, what happens is by not including race as a key indicator, then these technologies use proxies for race, like place, like income, things that we know if you don't take in race into account, you're essentially looking at race because our cities and our communities are so segregated by race that you end up pointing people out. San Diego is one of these cities that's in the process of, of deploying military grade drones over the city is something that, that they're that they're actually already doing i shouldn't say they're in the process of doing it san diego is trying to make an entire smart city where everywhere you go you see some sort of surveillance that is happening in these particular spaces 
I think it's a couple of things to note there that there are some um, some legislation that has been passed that becomes really, really important, such as the fate. Well, we'll talk about facial recognition a little bit, but the facial recognition technology warrant act and some other technologies in particular that one of my colleagues at Brookings, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, has done tons of work on. And part of what the legislation says is that law enforcement can use the technology if they have probable cause. So similar to everything else, they have to get a warrant, um, they have to get approval from a, from a judge, and then there are legalities on how long they can hold the data that they receive. Is it 48 hours? Is it 72 hours? Because see where we're going with this technology, because we talked about people's mobile phones and if you're in public, you can do that. But now a lot of people are starting to have um video devices on their homes whether that be ring or adt or or other companies that they're actually using who should have access to that technology because if a crime or an alleged crime happens outside of a person's house who has the right to access that technology who has the right to receive it the same way that people might have cameras within their homes so i say that to say we don't know but what we do know is that legislation needs to at least try to catch up because part of what happens and i and i know this because i have a, a virtual reality lab at the university of maryland and when you go private with some of these things part of what happens is you can offer incentives to police departments to pilot test your work to pilot test what you're doing with very little oversight like calling something a pilot <laughs> gives you a lot of leeway the problem is that law enforcement will take the technology and oftentimes having limited knowledge about it, definitely limited knowledge about its, its impact, its validity, its reliability, meaning just how robust it is for being accurate. They take that technology and they use it to police people. And that becomes highly problematic, when we, particularly when we start talking about protest, where despite what we see on the news, well over 90% of Black Lives Matter protests were nonviolent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not saying that some aren't violent, about 8%. Um, but oftentimes when that violence erupts, people are committing violence against property versus people. I'm not saying there aren't some incidents where people do get injured, but compared to right-wing protest, what we see when we compare right-wing protest to left-wing protest, say if you classify Black Lives Matter as a left-wing protest, what you see is not only are right-wing protests more likely to have guns, they are more likely to be violent, but they are less likely to have these type of surveillance, technological surveillance um, happening at these events. Now, on January 6th, they did use that technology. And part of that is because, you know, like I know, if you're in the DC area, everything's getting surveilled. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is they were able to use that technology to identify people. So a lot of people say, look, that's proof that this works well. Well, maybe. The problem is the lack of accuracy. And part of what happens when this technology is created is that who is creating the technology and the inputs that they put into the technology are not equitable at all. In short, oftentimes, not only do they not include people that, that potentially look like me and you, they definitely don't include people oftentimes that have our hairstyles. So part of what that's led to is people, Black people, and particularly Black women, are highly misclassified and there are incidents of people literally being arrested incarcerated and convicted of a crime they did not com commit because they took an image and confused them with someone else so we have to be careful with this technology and part of what happens is the more marginalized your identities the higher likelihood that your own um that your own image can be misused in ways that it shouldn't be yeah, the, um, the the point about who is in the room designing these algorithms and including that information is very important because you're right, they do not often look like you or I. Um, and then they go the route of, oh, well, we've done what needs to be done to make uh, to, to mitigate the bias and take the bias out. And oftentimes, like you said, the proxies come into play, the zip codes are used, different factors become the, the determining factor for determining race um, and so we have the issues uh, let's jump into uh, the the work that your lab for applied social science research does um, and is leveraging the use of ar and vr to help train police officers on the appropriate the appropriate responses to 
perceived harms. Um, can you share more about that work and the projected outcomes for that? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm really excited about this work. And, and it's obviously one of the reasons why we're having this conversation because mm -hmm. we've been in the trenches using technology and really thinking about how to leverage social science research and bring it together with technology. Uh, the big new thing that we've been doing is we partner with Jigsaw, which is a subsidiary of Google. And Jigsaw has a virtual reality training program for law enforcement called Trainer. And what Trainer does is it immerses uh, police officers into a virtual environment, into encounters that they experience every single day. So they put on virtual reality goggles, they can hear what's going on, and they hear from a dispatcher a call for service, just like they do every day, and they encounter a domestic house scene or a suspicious person or a person experiencing a mental health problem, they perform traffic stops. And part of the point of what we're trying to get at is how can we help officers to improve de-escalation strategies by utilizing communication versus force. Police officers are oftentimes trained that if you give two, a command two to three times and a person hasn't done it, you make them do it. Well, look, you, you can't simply body slam someone or, or suggest that you're going to harm someone or cut someone out simply because they don't obey your order, particularly if you haven't told them why you're stopping them. Um, and particularly if the person hasn't done anything wrong, which given the studies that I mentioned earlier, particularly when it comes to Black people and even Latinos in certain communities, that is a high percentage of people who law enforcement is coming in contact with. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is, is helped to create this virtual reality program. And we partner up with police departments. And what we do is, is we take officers through these virtual reality environments. What we're also doing on the back end is collecting a whole lot of data and information. We're collecting data on the scene that they go through, who they interact with, and particularly the, the race and the, and the gender of the person who they interact with. We're also collecting demographic information on the police officers themselves, as, as well as their attitudinal uh, measurements. So what they think, oftentimes their implicit attitude, so unconscious bias or implicit bias in the way that people think about it, as well as their explicit attitudes, which might get at explicit bias. And part of what we found thus far is that police officers don't really vary across their demographics. In other words, white and black officers don't really differ all that much in their level of bias. People think they do, but they really don't. They don't really differ all that much in their implicit bias or in their explicit bias. And I think that's something that's very, very important to note. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean that diversity of police departments don't matter. They do. They just matter in potentially different ways, like in, as you mentioned earlier, with tech companies, it's about for police who's sitting at the table, who's making policy when they're consciously thinking about and centering racial equity, transparency, accountability, those sort of things. The policy does trickle down to police officers on the street. And I think that those policy changes do augment the organizational structure of policing that can lead to cultural change of how people treat people. But accordingly, we don't find too many differences among the race or gender of the officers. Instead, what we find is that there are some officers who exhibit um, explicit racial bias and implicit racial bias, and then there are officers who don't. And so that's one finding. The other finding is that the setting matters a lot. In other words, do we see that police officers treat Black people and Black men in particular worse than they treat other groups? Well, we do see that to a certain extent, but we really see it when officers um, don't know who a potential victim and who an assailant might be. So that's what's key. So, so to be specific about it say, if, say if it's clear that a person has been the victim of a crime, they treat that black person just like everybody else. And I'm not saying there aren't cases that we could point to that you and I know where we see that, but in the studies we've done, uh, we see that playing out because we have these comparisons. The problem is when they encounter a person that they don't know who they are, when that ambiguity happens. The, the key social psychological concept that I want people to take away and start learning it is not simply or only bias, but a key term is called subjective uncertainty. When there is uncertainty and that uncertainty is subjective, which means it's in the, in the mind of the beholder, oftentimes what happens is people infer stereotypes and those stereotypes lead to discrimination. 
And because we know that there are more negative stereotypes associated with black people, particularly black men, about physicality, criminality, the, weapon, the weaponization of our blackness, it leads to less deference, it leads to less respect, and it leads to more discrimination against black people and black men specifically so those are some of our main findings and what we hope would happen with this virtual reality training program is that it gives officers the ability to go into a virtual environment and interact continuously over and over again in these different scenarios and they change that it changes who they encounter it changes what the people say because the algorithm is functioning like a normal person and part of what happens is if police officers are able to get the virtual reality character to calm down, that person gives them more information. If they're not able to get that person to calm down, they get more upset, they get more irate, and they give them less information. That happens with people all the time. Mm -hmm. What we're then able to do is give police officers a, a checklist in each scenario of what they should be accomplishing. Police trainers take their officers and their recruits through this program, and over time, we hope that officers will continuously learn strategies to de-escalate, to provide more communication and ultimately reduce bias and improve objectivity in their encounters with people on the streets. This is an amazing program. Um, just for moving forward with the technologies that are available and, and truly creating ones that that will be useful and helpful. Um, just just two questions kind of about um, the work that you're doing. Um, I, I guess on the front end, are these officers given any kind of um, awareness before they go into the virtual reality or are they they taking it as a I'm walking into a situation with kind of no understanding of what's happening? It's a great question. And you know, it, it it depends on the department and what they do. Um, and I say that to say, you know, we've been able to work with dozens of police departments across the country at this point, large, small, medium size, and, and we have the capacity to, to continue working with many more. And part of what we've learned is that different departments do things differently. There's not one size fits all. There are 18,000, roughly 18,000 police agencies in the United States. Mm -hmm. they're doing different things but in an ideal world <laughs> what would we want to have happen well you, you hit the nail on the head what we really want is an experimental design we mm -hmm. want officers to go through the training we figure out where some of the, the problems are where does the bias exist is it race is it gender is it place mm -hmm. uh what's going on with officers is, is it experience which is oftentimes a big one younger officers just haven't had enough reps as we say in sports enough repetitions to figure out what's going on whereas more experienced officers have and this is an important point to note um a slight aside but, but it's important is let, let, let's take a a couple of ideal types let's take um Derek Chauvin I think he he's an important and unfortunate ideal type he has a lot he had a lot of experience because he's no longer a cop he had a lot of experience mm -hmm. um and he had a lot of complaints he had a lot of use of force complaints. Say you take another officer who came in with Derek Chauvin, yeah, but that officer kept getting promoted and was good at their job, either because they were acting like Derek Chauvin or maybe, hopefully, they were just a really good, objective police officer who treated everyone the same. When that person gets promoted, you know, like I know, no matter what field you're in, when you're good at doing something and you get promoted, oftentimes you get taken away from what you're actually good at. So in policing, they get taken off the street. They get put behind a desk. They go into internal affairs or they go into training or they go into you know, some specialty unit. And while that sounds good, and, and it could definitely be good for that officer, part of what that means is that community just lost a great officer that was on the street. Who are they now left with? They're left with Derek Chauvin. And so who gets paired up? When, when, when new officers come out of the academy, who do they get paired up with? They get paired up with Derek Chauvin. Part of what I think what happened with George Floyd is not only did Derek Chauvin's officer, was he going along with everything he did, because Tao had a series of complaints as well. But Derek Chauvin was showing out a little bit for those two new officers that he had helped train. And that was one of their first days on the street. Who, mind you, that officer pulled a gun on George Floyd, which created part of the situation where George Floyd was doing nothing. He was just sitting in his car, and all of a sudden he has a gun pointing at him. That entire situation was a recipe that we try to prevent. So we have officers go through the training, the, the virtual reality training. 
based on what we find, because we do a lot of analysis on the back end, we provide a report back to the department. Based on those findings, we craft a, an implicit bias training for that department. There, of course, are some commonalities, but we do that. There's a great program that we run at the University of Maryland. There's also a great program in Georgetown that Christy Lopez runs called ABLE. Of course, Christy Lopez was one of the lead uh, people for the DOJ that handed down the Ferguson report. And, mm -hmm. and so she's also working broadly on this virtual reality project. So, so then we have that, that implicit bias training. We have that stimulus. And then we put those officers back through the training program, back through the VR to see what the differences are. And then long term, we track them on the streets because this training program is not a one off. The way it's set up, the equipment is actually pretty, pretty inexpensive. Right now, the software is made available from Jigsaw. Departments don't have to pay for that. And it doesn't take up a lot of space. So officers can repeatedly use this. And in an ideal world, we track it over time and we see the impact that it has. Thank you. you. You answered the second question, which is on the, <laughs> on the reports back to the uh, departments to see that kind of work out and, and play out. And I think it's an important note um, to make that these are focused on each department individually. Different departments, um, police different areas um, have different uh, demographic makeups. And so it's going to be important to uh, craft this technology to work for that department, to work for those officers um, overall, but really where they are. Um, let's get into uh, facial recognition technology. It's come up here and there, um, and you kind of pointed at it with uh, some of the different technologies that are employed by courts for recidivism rates, um, determining bail amounts, um, and my most recent, or the idea, the uh, example that sticks out to me is the Detroit man um, who was misidentified last summer um, and was uh, incarcerated based on the wrong facial recognition uh, determination. Um, and so we look at facial recognition technology as another form of digital surveillance that's becoming uh, more and more prevalent in our everyday lives. Um, what should be done about this at a federal, state, and local levels? Um, I know you talked a bit about legislation, um, and that is kind of something that is a, a constant mantra. There needs to be uh, more legislation um, and targeted legislation at these different technologies. Um, but if you could, in, in terms of the work that you've done in research, you've seen uh, the federal, state, and local levels, um, what should be done about facial recognition technology? So a couple of years ago, um, and one of the things that I love about research is that when you're doing it right and you're doing cutting edge work, you're, you're on the front end of some interesting things. Like people hear that all the time. A scientist will have some finding and people think they're just out in left field somewhere. And then it happens. It's actually to, to talk about something else that's happening big, big now is COVID. I mean, there was some scientists who predicted that we would be here. And at the time, several years ago, people were like, these people are way out in left field. This isn't going to happen. Then it happened. Facial rec is one of those things similar to virtual reality, um, mm -hmm. similar to what happened to Ahmaud Arbery that my research has predicted in some ways. And so to give people some stats and then answer your question, well, to answer your question, uh, lead into it, I actually think policymakers have to know the best questions to ask. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that is because, and I'll talk about some specific legislation, but the technology is moving so quickly so quickly like just even in the past 18 months two years the number of times we've had to update our virtual reality technology the equipment and the software i mean it's so many times like it, it changes like every 90 days it's changing like overnight as you know policy moves slow it doesn't keep up with those sort of things so policymakers need to know the questions to ask but I also want to set the tone for how um challenging this is and potential issues with facial rec facial recognition. As of 2016, half of the faces of American adults were in some part of facial recognition software database. Half, that was 2016. Today, I bet we're probably at 75%, if not more than that, particularly as we think about what happens with our phones, that they scan our faces to let us in, that on social media, these sort of things happen. Now, Facebook or, or Meta, did recently decide to, to do away with this facial recognition. And part of that is because of the problems associated with it. Here goes the issue though. Over 50% of people actually trust police's use of facial recognition technology. And they think that about 75% of people think that facial recognition 
accurately identifies people. That's just not true, though. And so to think about some of this, and I mentioned this a little earlier, but about 60 percent of uh, of white people and only 40 percent of black people, though, trust police officers use of technology. So we know that there is a gap there. So how do we think about this? Well, one of the things to think about is one study showed, as I mentioned earlier, that black women's gender was misclassified about a third to 40% of the time. This was Amazon's facial recognition software called Recognition with a K. They actually um, have decided to pause what they've been doing because when they did some studies, and again, this is, this is what's important. They actually did some studies. They said, okay, we still don't have it right. Let's pause. That's what we want. Right. We, we actually want that to happen. So they actually use professional athletes and then they put it into a database with criminals and their software misclassified all of these professional athletes in Boston as criminals. This was like even when Tom Brady was still playing, playing for the Patriots. So we see these sort of things playing out in 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 New York. One of the things they did, they took blurry images of actors and tried to put it with suspects and they found that they really couldn't couldn't deal with it in california they took lawmakers like people who've been elected in office and some of them were misclassified as criminals so clearly we have a lot of problems here um so so what do we do about it well look i, I think there can be some all some write out bans san francisco oakland other places in california have completely banned it and uh disbanded it in places like like even maryland they've moved in that direction so you see places that that are that are quite progressive on police reform are more likely to say we need to pause on this because the key concept here that people talk about is called techno racism techno racism is the thought that technology is going to be used disproportionately to impact uh, people of color and we have seen some of those things so i mentioned earlier about the facial recognition uh, the Facial Recognition Act, I think that's really, really important to think through. Um, it's the, the Facial Recognition Technology Warrant Act. Part of what that says is that not only was it bipartisan, but it said that if law enforcement wants to use facial rec recognition technology for over 72 hours, the legislation would dictate um, that they have to get judges approval and they can only have it for 30 days. That is if they've been doing an ongoing investigation. Now, some people say, well, the problem is that that creates a big loophole, which is the 72 hours. That suggests you could literally put it in place for 24 to 48 hours, stop it, and then restart it later, saying that you were doing a new one. That is, of course, highly problematic in terms of how we think about some of these things. The other big one is the Algorithmic Accountability Act that talks about how we need to think about algorithms that are baked in some of these things. So I think it's a lot of things that we can actually do that can improve some of the things that are going on. The algorithms that are in these technologies are highly problematic. Again, it's about the inputs. See, people think that computers are objective. They're only as objective as the people who created them. Someone had to create them. And if you don't have a diverse group of people at the table who have diverse ideas, then at least you putting in inputs that are going to lead to bias because our society is already baked into bias. Um, we also have the Justice in Forensics um, Algorithm Act. And part of what these aim to do, they require companies to assess their algorithms. This is really, really important from a legal standpoint, because as I mentioned before, and I know there's working with private companies, is that when you're working with private companies, part of what happens is they can go to a police department and they can say, look, we have $100,000 or we have $250,000 or we have a million dollars. We have a million dollars worth of technology we're gonna give you. If you use it and just let us get the data, what department isn't gonna jump at that? Um, they do, the tech, not the tech people get the, get the information, but then the department is using this information and that becomes pro a problem. So what the legislation needs to say is the same standards that we use to publish academic research, where to get technical, we start talking about statistical significance. We start talking about p-values and fit statistics and t-test, all this stuff that people like me get excited about statistically. But it's important because in academic research, we can't publish things unless, to, to say it in a different way, unless we know that 95 and oftentimes 99 out of 100 times, we will get the same outcome. We need to hold tech companies to the same standards because if not, we're going to be continuously putting people behind bars. It's going to be the same process that that the way we look at death row right now, where there are a lot of people, and you all do a lot of this work, where there are people getting out 
of prison and rightfully so for crimes that they should not have been incarcerated for to begin with. We're gonna go through that same process over the next 50 years, unless we get technology correct right now. Thank you. You pointed out um, several uh, legislative initiatives that are important um, in this space, and, and I would agree for the same reasons. Um, you pointed out before, and then just again, then with the incentives uh, for police departments to try out this technology. Um, and I think a concerning aspect of that is some of the training or the lack of training that these officers are um, given when, use these when using these technologies. Um, the departments will, will have the facial recognition technology come in um, in whatever form and they'll, and they'll use it. Uh, and then we'll see later on that maybe they didn't know how to use it or they, um, I believe there was an instance in Florida where uh, police officers were using it on the back end to arrest individuals, but then weren't reporting that they had used it because they couldn't articulate how that had happened. Um, and so we see several instances where the tech is there and it's being deployed and used, um, but then the lack of knowledge on those who are deploying it is, is where we find problems. Um, and looking towards the future, how should we be balancing the use of technology um, in the criminal justice reform efforts to ensure that they are not subjecting Black people to the next Jim Crow era? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I think techno racism is alive and well. And I think the way that is prevented is not only ensuring that policymakers know the right questions to ask. And again, I'm stressing the questions because the tech is changing so quickly that what we think facial recognition is today, I can tell you it's already something else moving forward into the future. And so part of thinking about that is that the way that we think about legislation is that we need to arm policymakers with the right questions to ask. And then what we do is we make sure that tech companies have a particular way in which they need to approach what's going on. We need to ensure that, that they can't simply deploy their technology, that there have to be regulations put in place in order to do it. I think also uh, we need to ensure that people are trained correctly in how to use the technology. You mentioned a second ago that part of thinking about this is that police officers, like you gave that example in Florida, and there are others, that they're using this technology and they don't even exactly know how to use it. So then they don't end up putting it into their reports. That's highly problematic. Whenever someone is using something, a key question to ask them is, can you simply explain it? Because if you can't simply explain it, then that suggests that maybe you shouldn't be using it because you're gonna encounter people, particularly in the criminal justice system, uh, lawyers, judges, jurors, who are gonna have a difficult time making sense of the way the technology is being used. And, and again, I think we can get there. It's very similar to forensic science. I mean, we go back to 30 years ago when DNA evidence started really being used in, in courts. I mean, of course they were being used sparingly before that, but the OJ trial really kind of catapulted DNA evidence into the forefront. And part of thinking about that is here we are 25 years later uh, a little over 25 years now later and it, it's a it's a common that that's going to be included but there are key standards so whenever we go through it there are all of these bumps in the road about how how things go and so i think as i mentioned i keep mentioning that there are these questions that people should use here goes i think some of these questions real quickly that i think people should be using to think through some of these things first has the community been informed and had an opportunity to ask questions there are tons of smart people in local communities who know what's going on, they know what's best for their community. People need to figure that out. What safeguards have been put in place to ensure that the technology is being used properly and is working as intended? That is so, so key. See, the smarter the technology gets, like for example, I just saw something, it scared me, honestly. I read an article recently that said that, um, or that robots are now learning how to birth themselves, like people, like it sounds crazy. And people are like, what, a robot having a baby? But these are, this is the advances in technology that's happening that are on our streets. I mentioned the police dog. Well, how can we ensure that those dogs that are trying to sniff out bombs, that are trying to sniff out drugs, um, that have the capabilities to shoot and kill people, don't all of a sudden malfunction? So are, are we making sure that they work as intended? And then 
How will we guard against bias in the technology? That is so, so important to be able to do. And part of this, again, starts with what's happening in Silicon Valley. These tech companies must diversify and they must, must diversify at the top. Uh, one of your alma maters, Howard, along with other HBCUs are producing some of the best talent in, on the planet. And we need to be able to leverage that. Fourth and fifth real quickly is how will the technology move beyond consent to privacy concerns? That's a big one. How do we think about privacy connections, particularly as people are starting to use these technologies in public ways? And then finally, are there ways for the technology to actually be used as training like what we're doing? I tend to think right now that that is the space to keep using the tech is in training, is to take certain cases and incidents that have happened, say for some of these technologies that are gonna be used more publicly on the streets and test them with what the outcomes that we already know and see if they come, if the technology ends up with the same results. But I do think that there's bipartisan support um, at the federal level for addressing what is happening with uh, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, technology, geofencing, social media tracking, all of these sort of things. And then we know there are certain cities and states that are out front that are really trying to ban some of these things. Doctor, thank you. You've given um, you've given all of us a lot to think about when uh, when thinking about the technologies that not only we use in everyday life, um, but that exist that we might not even think about as we go outside to go shopping or um, go to a different uh, different types of public events. Are it's kind of scary, um, but it does help to kind of understand how those are being used. And you've done a lot of great work in this space uh, and given a lot of um, good definitional support for a lot of the different things that people hear about and aren't certain about, you know, what this means. What does, um, you know, virtual reality mean? What does that look like? And um, all of the uh, technologies we've discussed here today. Um, so if there is anything that you could add um, just to anyone watching uh, that they could do on their own, whether it be uh, go out and talk to legislators um, and you know, kind of really activating on the ground um, and, and raising, raising the awareness for these different technologies. Um, is there anything that you would think that an individual could take upon themselves to do? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I'm a huge fan of, of civic participation in a bunch of different ways, well beyond what happens with elections and well beyond um, you know, paying attention when, when something happens. I think we have to try to work within the trenches uh, during the midterm era, if you will. And that includes contacting our elected officials, whether you voted for them or not, they represent where you are. And part of what that means is paying attention to what's happening at the local and state level. One thing that people oftentimes don't know is a lot of hearings are publicly available. Um, during COVID, I think people have started to learn this more as things have been online, but you can you can view hearings, you can access them, you can see who's testifying. I know that's one of the things I do often is I testify at the state and federal level often on some of the issues we're talking about, uh, among others. I mean, racial equity writ large, but how we think about wealth distributions and how we think about health and family. And so you can use your expertise. You can write a letter, you can send an email, uh, policymakers and their staff actually do read these things. And then you can find out what are the hearings that are happening that deal with, in this case, technology, but could also just deal with racial equity and other issues more broadly, where you want to make your presence known, where you want to tell someone what you think about it. And then, of course, people can always decide to run for themselves or they can support someone else who's running. They can start saying, hey, you know, we, we need to ensure that people like you are part of the political and, and civic participation process. I think there are a lot of ways to make our presence and our voice known and to kind of merge uh, a couple of, of my famous or of my, of my favorite and famous legislatures, uh, that being um, Shirley Chisholm and John Lewis, who Shirley Chisholm said, you know, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And then John Lewis, who said, um, it's not simply about being at the table but you got to make sure you're not on the menu because or else someone's eating you for lunch. So if you're going to be sitting at the table, they need to let you fix the food or else you're going to continue to be served what other people already have. So part of what that means is we have to think consciously about that process and what's going on and paying attention to what is coming into our communities and telling people like, look, we don't want these technologies yet because they haven't necessarily been verified or if they are going to come in, let's ensure that they're coming in in a way where they might take, say, 10% of cases or calls for service for a department. 
um, or maybe even a smaller percentage, because that's a lot of calls for service, two to two to five percent and tested over time. And then those data need to be reported back to the community. I can tell you in Nashville, this is happening, being led by uh, Councilman Brandon Taylor, as well as uh, Jill Fitchard, who runs the Nashville's Community Oversight Board. I think that is second to none that uh, people should replicate that around the country and look at the way they approach things. They have had so many meetings about license plate readers, which is something that is happening. They are ensuring that people in Nashville are informed, they are getting their perspectives. And I think that when that technology is deployed, because I think that it probably will be, it will be informed with community best practices and be evaluated over time. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you so much for uh, your thoughtful responses to, to all of the questions um, and, and for taking the time to really go through in depth some of your research and the amazing work that you're doing with the lab um, at this time. If anyone would be more interested in finding out about um, the work that Dr. Ray has done, um, you can find that at his page on Brookings at the Brookings Institution. You can also go to, um, and I think I don't want to mess up the acronym, the L a s s r is it dot com or dot org um yeah so it's uh yeah thank you for that yeah l a s s r u m d dot com so l a s s r u m d dot com that stands for the lab for applied social science research at the mm -hmm. university of maryland people can see the virtual reality program we have um a few video clips people can learn about our train the trainer program and all the other work we do um you know in the academy Everybody likes acronyms, so we we call we call it laser, even though it's like it doesn't have an e. And it, so somebody said that I was like, people are gonna be confused by that, but I like it. So so laser <laughs> is what we call it, but it's the lab for applied social science research. So people can go to lassrumd.com, and people can also just follow me on social media at sociologist Ray. Um, I tend to post a lot of things, and people can find the websites there as well. Thank you. Um, and Bishop, I'll hand it back to you for the closing words. Hey, oh, we, thank uh, you, thank you for both to both of you for leading such a great panel. I really enjoyed that. And on behalf of Reverend Jackson, we we thank you at Rainbow Push Coalition. Uh, this is our last session. Um, so we thank all of the attendants, those who, who have been viewing it at both our Facebook page and our YouTube page. We also would like to extend um, a thank you to all of our sponsors, uh, Verizon Communications, um, Charter Communications, the, C the CTIA, um, and all of those who will be mentioned when we close this particular session on our cover session. So we thank you and we look forward to um, having continuing the discussion in future events. Thank you so much.